This is a weekly step meeting. Our format is as follows. A speaker is asked to talk for 25, 30 minutes on the step of the week, followed by discussion or questions until 7 p.m. You can find these weekly meetings on our YouTube page, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe, and share. Smash it. Smash it, baby. That brings us to the speaker portion of the meeting on this day of April 10th, 2023, in Doylestown, PA, at the Monday night, 6 p.m., Stay, Stay Alive Literature, and Step Group of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Tonight's speaker is Mickey, and he will be sharing his experience on Step 10. Please help me welcome Mickey. So my name is Mickey, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Mickey. Um, real quickly, um, my PSA announcement for everyone is, is I do stand up. The reason I stand up is because I want to make eye contact with everybody. Um, that's what was suggested of me because I do believe this is a life or death situation. Um, so no matter when I'm asked to either share my story, speak about a step or a discussion, um, I like to be up looking at everybody. Because I'm sure that if I asked you to raise your hand, if you've lost a personal friend or a family member as a direct result of this disease, almost everyone's gonna raise their hand. Uh, which usually solidifies that this is life or death. Number two, I do get dressed up a little bit. I'm a painting contractor. I wear dirty, crappy clothes all day long, every day. But I suit up and show up because that's what was suggested of me when I came in. I cannot repay AA for what it did for me in my life. Um, but one service commitment at a time, you know, picking up that phone call at 2.30 in the morning, picking up sponsees, bringing them to meetings, picking up anybody who calls me to bring them to a meeting, I can then pay, repay AA, little by little, one little thing at a time. Um, so I suit up and show up to show respect for, for the program that gave me so much. Um, with that being said, I do have a sobriety date. It's September 17th, 2012. I do have a sponsor, which is an incredible thing for me to say because my first sponsor passed away in October of 2021 and I spent six months without a sponsor and, uh, and like, I thought I was fine, right? Like, you know, everybody sees the changes around us first before we see it, right? And, and I was six months in, man, and um, I was asked to speak at a meeting in Souderton and a really good friend of mine was chairing. He was the one that asked me to speak, who had been with me from day one, knew my sponsor. Um, and uh, after the meeting was over, he was like, Mickey, you need a sponsor. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he goes, no, dude, like you sound like I've never heard you sound before. Like you sound almost egotistical. And like, and that hurt, but it was the truth, right? Because other people saw it. I'm still living in recovery. I'm, I'm still working with other people. I'm still praying. I'm doing all of those things, but I didn't have anyone to lean on, right? So it was like self-will ran riot came out. So um, I actually got sponsored like within that month. And, uh, you know, God bless good sponsorship. God bless this book. Um, but, yeah, it's awesome. He's, uh, he's as crazy as I am, and uh, that's awesome because, like, you know, I don't have to worry about anything with him. Um, and I do have a home group. We meet in Telford on Friday nights at eight o'clock. Uh, it's kind of a really cool meeting, different than most others because it's chair's choice, man. You have no idea what you're gonna walk into on Friday nights. Uh, we do have super comfortable trampoline chairs. So like, it is like, once you come to that meeting, people are like, wow, these chairs are nice. Now these got cushions on them. So this could be, you know, this could rival our trampoline chairs, but it's an awesome meeting. Um, it was, it's less than a mile from my house, which was huge when I first came into the program. Um, so yeah, those are three things. Um, so look, I'm gonna, I, we're gonna talk about this step for a little bit, but I'm gonna qualify myself real quick. And it is real quick for me to qualify myself because I am a blackout drunk. I started drinking when I was 16. I was blacking out from the gate. Uh, it took, took about six months before I started dabbling in everything else. But within, within a year, I was drinking every single day. And I wasn't picking up the drink in the morning before high school, but I was drinking immediately after high school was done. I went to high school right down the street from here. 
and it was extremely common for me. I played soccer, um, and uh, it was extremely common for me. We would have a night game at 7 o'clock to get out of school. We would do a whole bunch of things, and then we would start drinking, and I would come back fully loaded. I mean, fully loaded to run around on the soccer field with my family, the stands screaming and cheering and acting like an absolute knucklehead lunatic. And I never thought there was anything wrong about that. I would, I mean, seriously, I would like, when I'd be driving from wherever I was back to the game, to the stadium, I'd be like listening to like Rage Against the Machine to get fired up and I'm loaded. And then you put me out on a soccer field. It's just like, it was a mess, but like, that's not how you live. That's not like, that's not the right way to live. Right. But that's what I did. Um, but anyway, I was a blackout drunk from the gate and I'm a four time DUI offender. So, uh, I got my first DUI in 97 and my sobriety date, September 17th, 2012. I got my fourth the day before that. And since that day, I have never felt the need or the urge or the want to pick up a drink or a drug because of this program, because of good sponsorship. And because I took suggestions that were given to me, um, you know, I was told very early on that these 12 steps were 12 suggestions, 12 simple suggestions that we make difficult. You know, I was angry, pissed off and scared when I came into this program and everyone that I met in there was happy, joyous and free. And, and I wasn't mad that they were, I didn't like resent them for that or anything, but I didn't understand because I couldn't believe that my life would be happy, joyous, and free without a drink or a drug. And, um, you know, but, you know, the book talks about it. I had absolutely no idea what was going on. Um, what I do know is that God reached out and started working in my life before I realized it. And these people were giving me simple suggestions to live a different way. And, you know, like most alcoholics, right? I had so many problems. I did not come in on a winning streak. I just told you that. Um, but I had so many problems and I wanted to fix them all right away. Right. And that's not possible. Okay. Like I can't, my best thinking, you know, got me a fourth DUI and I'm getting ready to go back to jail again. Um, but I need to fix everything right away. And, and one of the first lessons I was taught was, to just live in today, to just be grateful for today. I was told that I was not special, that I can't do anything that happened about yesterday, last night, or even this afternoon. And I'm certainly not special enough to control what's gonna to happen tomorrow. So why don't I just be grateful for today? You know, and that, I was like, okay, like I can do this, you know, and just for today, don't pick up that drink. And that's how my program started, very easy. like. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of stupid, but I'm not, like, I understand things and like, you know, I can comprehend things, but I needed someone to break that down very simple to me, you know, because left to my own devices, left in my house by myself after the meeting, I start thinking about everything that's going to happen and go on. And there's no need for me to worry about that, live in fear of that, right? So I started going through this work. And, um, you know, my, uh, my sponsor was not a soft, cuddly man. He was very, he was very, I guess, brash is a very good word to use. I used to call him a curmudgeon of an old man. Um, and when I would ask him questions, he would not coddle me and be like, it's going to be okay. Like he would yell at me and say, you know, stop being so selfish or, you know, why wouldn't you do this? Or why wouldn't you do that? And, and that's what I needed. But anyway, we go through, like, I love talking about 10. I think 10 is like six and seven, in my opinion, six and seven get ripped off only being a paragraph long. I think it might only be two sentences long, each of them. But 10, there is so much in 10 and it's just over one page, right? It starts halfway through on one page and goes just a little bit past that halfway mark on the second page of it. But there is so much in that and I love I love to use 10 as like, or what I believe that Bill and Bob were trying to do was that was that safety net for us. That was the rip cord, that was the parachute that we have in this program. You know, it states in there, 
you know, that selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. It says that when these things crop up, it doesn't say if these things crop up, it says when they do. So we got these four things. I mean, I've heard them called the four horsemen. I've heard them called the four on four. So when these four things occur, here are the four things you need to do to take care of that, right? So I need to ask God to remove that immediately. I need to speak to somebody quickly about that. I need to make amends right away if I have harmed anybody. And then I resultly need to turn my attention and thoughts to helping someone else out. So the four things in that for us to deal with it, right? It doesn't say like tomorrow or in a little bit. It, it all says like right away, immediately, quickly, right? Because if I let those things fester inside, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do a four step again. And I don't want to do a four step again, right? But it gave us this. I don't use it as a reservation to act like a knucklehead jerk out on the road or with my family or with anybody and be like, you know what? It's cool. I can take my will back right now. I can act like this because I have a way to deal with it. No. I practice these principles on all my affairs, but I am not perfect. It, the book talks about progress, not perfection. I know it talks about that specifically with spirituality, but I truly believe that is everything in my life is progress, not perfection. So I practice these things in all my affairs, and when these things crop up, when they crop up, this is how I deal with it. You know, and that to me is phenomenal. You know, I, I was taught very early on, um, I had gotten a six month, I, no, I had gotten my, uh, my 90 day coin and I went to a meeting in Quakertown and man, I was so happy to have that 90 day coin, right? So happy. And I walked into this meeting and, uh, Mike, the mechanic, angry Mike, um, was in there and he shared and I went up to him afterwards cause he was like telling my story just 10 years before me. Right. And like, I just went up to thank him and like, and I pulled that 90 day coin out and I was like, look, dude, like, look at this, man. Like I'm doing this. And like, and he looked at me and said, no, dude, that's not what it's about. Like I was so excited. Right. And he pulled out a 24 hour coin from his pocket and he handed it to me and said, this is the only coin you need to carry around. Right. And that, you know, I was just being reassured over and over again. Like, yeah, it's good to celebrate those anniversaries. It's good to have time. But what I truly have is today. And 10 allows me to be happy, joyous, and free no matter what happens during my day. You know, and I, I mean, this stuff was set long in motion well before me, you know, and God knew all these things were going to happen. But I was taking these suggestions. I was listening to these people about what to do in this program and when those things happen, you know, and, and I reach out to people, I pick up the phone, I call, I surround myself with good people, with good recovery, you know, to help me out because these things are going to happen, you know? And, um, you know, the other major part that I love and yeah, I am like a big book thumper, you know, and I'm proud of it. Okay. I am, you know, but in 10, it talks about, we are not, we don't have a cure. We're not cured of this. We have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And what that means to me is that every day, God willing, if I wake up, I get on my knees first thing in the morning and I pray because I'm working on my spiritual condition because I didn't have one before. See, I thought I was the most important thing in the world. I thought I knew what was best for me. And this, I was completely broken and destroyed and I had zero guidance. God intervened in my life and then I developed a relationship with God and my spiritual condition is based on what I'm doing about it. Now I sit here, I got a little bit over 10 and a half years and I'm not saying this is not bragging, but I have zero problem praying all day long. I have zero problem telling anyone in my life, complete strangers, my wife, my parents, like I need to walk away right now because I have to pray because that's what I was. That's what worked for me early on when things happened. Right? So I'm going to tell you how this is, how this step is so key and so crucial in my life. But I will tell you one of the funniest stories that I do have about, about this step is, you know, we do our fourth step, we do our fifth, 
you know, we finish this list off on eight and then nine comes, right? And my sponsor, the way we did it was he wanted me to make three amends before we moved on. So, uh, so I made three amends and um, we started reading the 10 step, right? So I knew about 10 and I knew how 10 worked and we talked about it, right? So I was planning to go see my mom and dad to make amends to them. And um, so like I had set it up. Now I'm not gonna stand up here. I'm not gonna tell you that my parents are alcoholics. I will tell you my, my opinion is that my parents suffer from addiction problems. So it was March Madness um, and my dad and I were real big basketball fans together and would watch them together. So I knew my dad would be drinking early. So I called and set up to meet my parents at two o'clock on Saturday. And uh, I called like early in the week, like I called like on Tuesday. Is everything still good for Saturday? You know I'm coming over. I would like to make amends to you. They're like, yeah. I called again on like Friday, like, hey, I'm gonna be over at two o'clock tomorrow, right? I'm trying to plan this perfect amends process. So I go walking in the house and my dad's drinking. He's got his drink in his hand. He's sitting at the table, he's watching basketball. And I was like, okay, that's all right, it's no problem. Then I realized like my dad doesn't really like, he's got a pretty good buzz on right now, that's okay. I go outside, I call my sponsor, I tell him I'm, I'm making my amends. He prays with me, prays for me, I pray, I go back in and I pick up, I sit down, I open up the book, I take the remote control to turn the TV off and my dad starts screaming at me. <laughs> and then I get completely defensive and I'm like, what, I, what are you talking about dad? Why do you have to watch the, ba the basketball game? I'm here to make amends to you for all the crap that I did. So now I'm arguing with my father, right? I'm raising my voice, okay? And my mom starts crying and I slam my book and I'm like, I'm out of here. Well, first off, I don't even have my driver's license. I had gotten dropped off, so I can't even really go anywhere. So I walk outside, you know, my mom's saying, please don't, please don't. And I go outside and like, and then that's when I realized like, oh my God, I'm stuck right now. Like I can't go anywhere. So I pick up my phone, I call my sponsor, he doesn't pick up. So I open up the book and I start, I start reading. And like, and I calm down and then he called me and I said, Rich, I just need you to pray for me right now because I just screwed up. And he goes, well, it sounds like you're gonna 10 step your father before you nine step him. So get back in there, do what you need to do. So I ended up 10 stepping my father and then making my nine step events to him. So like a great alcoholic, it was completely, you know, mixed up, but that's just the way it was, right? Cause those things crept in, right? I got selfish because I tried to set this perfect thing up. I got, you know, very, very resentful like that. You know, like this is about me. I'm, I'm here to make amends for everything I did wrong, right? But those things creeped up and I did what I had to do. Um, but anyway, we're gonna fast forward now. So that was 2013. So last year my father got diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it's been a very long, hard process to get to this point. Last March he was diagnosed. We sit here on April 10th. Um, and I've been a major part of helping my mother and father out with this. Um, but this program and all, everyone in the program have shown me that like, you're going to have to rely on the 10 step because so many things are gonna occur like all the time, right? And what's happening is my mom is a drama queen and she is trying to control everything. And it's, it, truthfully, it's pissing me off, right? Like mom, calm down like dad you don't have to correct dad every single time I mean I've I've probably had 30 conversations with my father you know in the last you know four months and he's called my wife the right name once right but I know what my father's talking about right I know what he's talking about I don't need to correct him but everybody else that comes over has to correct my father it doesn't matter how much I talk to him about it. It doesn't matter how much like I try and plan this out, right? Like, mom, you don't need to do this to dad. You don't need to correct him every single time he, he talks about what brother's alive and what brother's not. But anyway, my brother makes a surprise trip two weekends ago. 
comes down um, there's some other family issues going on you know that that's a whole different meeting and that's a lot longer than 30 minutes but he comes down I've been talking to my brother about this and how I how it's been working for me to handle conversations with my father I'm like trying to help my brother out right my brother put the drink down a year before I did but he is on the marijuana maintenance program okay so I continue to talk and talk and talk to him well he doesn't have a program I do and I walk in that house when he's there and I'm we're hanging out it took about 30 minutes before my brother got pissed off on my dad and started yelling at him and immediately I started getting resentful right and the reason I'm getting resentful is because you didn't listen to me I told you He's going to ask you this question over and over again. I don't care that it pisses you off. He doesn't even understand. He has no idea, right? And I'm getting resentful for him. And I'm sitting there being quiet, and then I'm like, okay, well, this isn't good, right? Because now this resentment's building up in my head. You know, and now I'm sitting here like, okay, so I leave. I go outside. Like I said, I have zero problem telling anyone I'm going to go pray or do something. I go outside. I call my sponsor right i prayed for god to remove that you know i did not i didn't do anything at all to warrant an amends to my brother but i called my brother later that day and i said listen man i don't know how my facial expressions were but like i was really getting upset about how you were treating dad and i'm sorry you need to handle your situation with dad without me butting in and telling you what to do and he's like no i didn't feel any way from you but that, like it was gone, that feeling that I had was gone because I did exactly what the book says to do, right? It is, dude, it's that like, yo, if you watch, um, you watch like Top Gun or Top Gun Maverick, man, it's that ejection seat, right? That is how I view 10. It's that parachute. It is that way for me to get out of the negativity that's going on with me at that point because it is going to happen. I am not perfect. I am so far from it. As a matter of fact, I love my imperfections. They're phenomenal, right? Because it helps me grow. It helps me help people out. I don't use my four DUIs and my two jail bids as like a pity party, like feel bad for me. I don't. I use that to help some other people out, right? I'm like the coolest designated driver in my group of friends. It is awesome. But man, I can't get them to call me to pick them up. Like they, I'm like, and that, so now I say, dude, do you want to turn out like me? But like, I think I actually turned out pretty good right now, man. I think I'm actually doing pretty good, man. I have people call me DUI expert. That makes me feel pretty good, dude. Right. But it's only because of this program. It's only because of this daily reprieve that I have. And look, I might've lost the choice of, you know, when I put a drink in me, what happens, right? But I do believe that God, my higher power, gives me that choice if I am grateful enough to wake up in the morning to do something about it. And that that's something that's for me to get down on my knees and pray right away. All right? I am getting a little bit older, so like like sometimes I really gotta pee really bad in the morning. So like I say I say quick prayers and then I go pee and then I get down and I do my good prayers, right? But I pray first thing in the morning. I reach out to another alcoholic every single day, not by text. I love texting. It's great. Um, lots of people in here text me every single day and I love it, but I like to reach out and make that connection on the phone. I try my best to get to a meeting every single day, or at least to be of service to help somebody get into a meeting. And that doesn't work out, man. Like my life has gotten so incredible and it has made me very busy, right? But I don't let my life get in the way of Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not. And then the last thing I do at night is I pray. The last thing I do before I get into bed, you know? And the funny part about that is I'm a real big reader. So like, I like to read in bed and I, like I would take everything like literally, right? So I called Rich um, and I was like, look, you told me the last thing I have to do at night is pray, but like, is it okay if I pray and then get in bed and read? Like, I don't try and go to bed right away. And he's like, dude, what is wrong with you? Like, you know, like, yes, that's fine. It's the, it's your, you know, it's the last thing. I was like, well, dude, I don't want to screw up. Cause like, I'm scared if I screw this up, I'm going to go back out. Right. You know, 
But the truth of the matter is if I continue to talk about it, I continue to practice these things, you know, on a daily basis, I will continue to be happy, joyous, and free. You know, this book has never steered me wrong. The 12 steps have never steered me wrong. As long as I'm willing to practice those things, you know, does it feel good? <clears throat> you know, when I slip up and act like a knucklehead and I get selfish or I get self-centered or egotistical, like, no, it doesn't feel good. But you know what feels good is then calling and talking to somebody about that right away. What feels good is praying, you know, and that fact, that last part in there where it says we resolutely turn our thoughts to helping someone else out, well, that's what I've done for 10 and a half years. That is what I've done, whether it's commitments, whether it's phone calls, whether it's taking people through the program, right? I don't pick and choose those four things, what I want to do, right? I don't, I don't go like, you know what? I'm going to pray to God, I'm going to call Howard, and I'm going to go on with my day. No. I have four things that I need to do. Those four boxes have to be checked off. And, you know, this program, you know, when you break it down very simple, you know, we, we, um, we build up a spiritual relationship, you know, we, we, um, we pray, and then we help other people out because that keeps us out of our own head, right? And that 10th step, that's the last piece of it, that you go help someone else out. You know, stop being so selfish and start being more selfless. You know, and when I do those things, I get to enjoy this life. I get to enjoy all these promises that come true. You know, nothing was ever said in here that I can just hang out now and everything's going to be good, right? You know, um, I, Ron, I'm not calling you out or anything or like putting you on the spot. I mean, sorry, calling you out. But like, I continue to see what Ron does on a daily and weekly basis. You know, I see Ron a lot and like, that's that's my hope that if I continue to do this, I won't be sick and suffering. You know that I can get, I can continue to do this and be happy, joyous, and free. You know, I mean, I get those, I get those questions now a lot. That's like, really, like how many meetings do you go to a week? And I, I go to three in-person meetings and I do two Zoom meetings a week. And they're like, are you going to like do this for like ever? And I go, well, I can't tell you that, but one day at a time, I'm going to do this. Because it's just like, I, Ron and I joke about the coolest things. Ron's the one that calls me the DUI expert, man. Like, it's super awesome. Like, like, I have fun. I have more fun now than I could ever imagine, right? But it starts with what I do on a daily basis, you know? I, if I would like to continue having this, I, I know that my freedom, I know that my happiness, my, my joyousness, being content, all of that is dependent on what I'm doing, my spiritual condition on a daily basis. And no matter what happens, no matter how I act, I have a way to deal with that if I'm willing to do it. If I'm willing to be honest, you know. Um, I love 10. I think step 10 got ripped off in the book. I think it should have been elaborated on. Um, but, you know, one day at a time, I will continue to keep coming back. I will continue to trust God, clean house, and help others. My name is Mickey. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for letting me share. Great, brother. Thank you. It wasn't me, though. It was God. Okay. And a little bit of Ron. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks for a, a great message. Please limit, limit your sharing to three minutes. Uh, please keep your shares related to the step. If you feel like drinking or if you had a drink today, please see me or speak to someone after the meeting. We ask that you please refrain from the use of profanity. We are in a church and on a spiritual journey. With that, I open up the meeting. You in the back.